Hello everyone, in today's video I thought we'd start a brief series on the 787. There have been so many things that have changed on this aircraft uh, since we did a video on this a few years back, so I thought it'd be worthwhile to kind of take it and break it into three basic sections. Our first video is going to be dedicated to kind of what everything is and kind of getting everything all set up. The middle video is basically going to be all your uh, takeoff and kind of cruise. And then the final video is going to be dedicated, of course, to sort of in-flight stuff as well as the automatic pilot, as well as using the new Autoland feature that we have built into the 787. Now, there's one thing you probably notice already, and that's the fact that uh, everything's just slightly chunky. Uh, that's just because this aircraft has just got so many systems on it. It even slows my computer down. So uh, let's get started. So for those of you not familiar with the 787, it is uh, basically a very, very, very uh, large, it's again, not a 747 by any means. It's actually smaller than a 777. It's kind of like a bigger version of like a 767. It's uh, kind of in the middle there. It's a great aircraft, a uh, fantastic range. Uh, you can tell by those uh, teeny tiny little wings that you have on those hips here, that this thing is obviously, we're taking advantage of all the latest and greatest aerodynamic effects. And of course, we have all sorts of different bells and whistles on here in order to make our lives a little bit more efficient and effective. And just look at the size of the the engine relative to the rest of it and you can see it's got these little chevrons in the back to help reduce noise all in all it's a really really slick airplane now the other cool bits of this is because there's so many new features in it there's a lot of stuff up in the flight deck that is a little different from those of you who might be familiar with like a 737 or a 727 and that's the fact that we have these huge huge full color displays these are all touch screens which is awesome we still have the big old chunky oak which is kind of nice but notice how you don't have the knee destroying uh, trim wheel down here anymore that's all done electronically and also our radios, you probably recognize this set here, but we now have a nice digital computer to actually assist with the prop first process, it helps to say that sometimes, of actually getting everything all set up on here. And of course, our starting sequence is all done automatically now, and everything is, uh, like I said, very, very impressive. Notice, of course, we still have the standard uh, Boeing little handles here and everything like that. So when you first climb in, uh, it's a good idea to have a pretty good idea of where you intend to go. Now, I know that's uh, one of those things you're like, what do you mean? Well, can I just do touch and goes with this? Sure, you could absolutely do that. But this aircraft is designed for long distance journeys. Uh, we're not going to take a long distance journey in it. We're actually going to be taking about an hour flight kind of total time. So when you first get in, of course, uh, looking down, you have a couple different things that are going to be sort of the key elements that you're going to be operating here. Uh, starting over here on our left, all of our lighting controls and, of course, our foot heat, very, very critical in this airplane, is down here. Uh, the reason this is valuable is, by the way, if you take this and left click on it, you can hide it. All these are going to be very, very helpful for us if it's a nighttime, for example, and we want to adjust it. Another thing you want to watch out to, too, is uh, you have these sort of options here. This is only part of the lights that you're actually going to have on board. You're going to have other lights as well, depending on what situation that you actually you're going to need for um, lighting a particular item. So it's one of those things where they try to make it easy for you as far as having the good places for them. But honestly, the way they build the light switches all over the place is probably going to make you insane. And uh, you'll know what I mean uh, when you go hunting for them. Uh, coming to the right here, of course, so we have our two main displays here. You can program these any way you want. This is not like an old Airbus A310 or something like that. We have one display for this. You can swap these. You can put different screens on, and we'll show you how to do that in a little bit. We even have a little computer screen down here for manual entry of all sorts of different items. This is going to be very important for us um, uh, later on. One thing you want to watch out for, though, is uh, see how you have this little thing. This is MFD with the buttons. We'll show you this in a minute. But keep in mind, don't get these two sets of buttons confused. Uh, you'll know it the first 10 times you do it. Sitting up here, of course, we have a mode control panel. This is going to be all the magic of the automatic pilot is going to be located here. And whenever you're looking for anything autopilot related, it's probably going to be somewhere inside of this box. Although there are going to be a couple other elements we're going to have to deal with, especially the radio, but we'll deal with that a little later on. On the co-pilot side, or the pilot not flying, depending on what airline you are and where you are, you have a duplication of all the controls that this guy has on the left. So you can have a tremendous amount of data presented if you need to, or you can minimize things as much as possible, which for me as a pilot, the older I get, the more I actually appreciate simplicity. You know, like, give me the information when I need it, but don't blast me with it all the time kind of a deal. Uh, swinging over on this side, you also notice we have all the same kind of dials and doodads and stuff like that. Now, when I look directly above my head, you have the overhead panel. Now, one of the things I recommend you do is uh, save yourself one of the camera pieces so you can get this one set up. This one is sort of a malligation of like your Airbus A320 with a little bit of 737. There's definitely some overlaps in here, but it has the same basic Boeing philosophy as you start in one corner, you go down, Next corner, next row, next row, and that's basic column, I should say. That's basically going to be your method for basically setting this aircraft up. 
Uh, the key thing that you need to keep in mind is not all these buttons work. And if you actually hold your mouse over several of them, you're going to get a big old thing that says inoperative. That's okay, because uh, we can still safely operate the aircraft without those systems. But one of the things you will notice, especially if you're coming back to this airplane after not having been around for a while, is if I hold my mouse over some of these buttons, you'll notice they actually work now. So uh, that's definitely something we want to kind of keep in mind. Another thing you're going to probably notice here is you got this big, big eval right here. Uh, this just saying we have available external power that we can engage uh, pretty much right away. All these other switches have been uh, kind of preset for us, and it's really not too much. Uh, things you want to keep an eye out when uh, we are working up here, uh, our electrical panel, of course, it's exactly the same style as all Boeing. Basically, you just follow the lines to determine where's going from what kind of a thing like that. You can see clearly our AP generator. It feeds these two buses. We have two separate uh, controls for this. And you can see from there, you have our generator controls, our two generators per engine ready to rock. And you can even see how everything is. Uh, missing here, you probably can observe, is that uh, we don't have a bus tie. Everything's uh, done automatically on this aircraft. All the synchronization of all the motors, everything's done automatically. So many things on this aircraft are electric and not hydraulic. It would it, it just would blow you away. Swing up here to the top. You have a bunch of different items as far as, you know, a little flight door power. For some reason, you have to turn this on. Um, it, it gets very grumpy at you if you don't. Of course, you can also have our emergency lights. These are those little uh, track lights on the floor. Make sure you go ahead and uh, set that before you get too carried away here. We have our window heat. Uh, it's basically chilling right here. I like how they moved it from here over on this side up to here. Just mixing you up. You have your hydraulic system. Uh, fortunately, they keep it super duper simple here because everything is an auto setting. You don't have to worry about uh, going absolutely nutters with these. Obviously, there's some rules for this, but we'll get that in a minute. Passenger signs. I like how there's just a button to. <laughs> in the event that you just need to ding that at some particular point. Up on this side, of course, you have all your cargo fire. None of this works. You can relax about that. We have our engine controls. The engines on this is they're wild. I'll notice there's no fancy pick the right igniter. We just don't have that anymore. That's not something we have to stress out about. The ability to jettison fuel, always nice. Our fuel system, again, it's the same style as you've seen on other Boeings. You just follow the arrows. So these pumps would pump out of here. Go ahead and head to the left engine. This one will come over here and pump over to the right engine. Should you need, you have a cross-feed feature, and there's an automatic balancing function, which actually works really well. Below here, you'll notice that all of our ICEs now have an auto setting, which is absolutely wonderful because you can set it and forget it, you know, very much like a 777 kind of a thing. We have all of our lights. Uh, notice they're cutting down on switches. Uh, they're leaving buttons for buttons. Basically, the things you set and forget, uh, they're buttons now. Uh, things you click on and off all the time are clicky clicks. So you'll notice things like our uh, taxi, for example, and our turn off. Those are clicky clicks. The ones we just push and forget are just like that. Also appreciate the indicator lights here. You have a little test option, but it doesn't work. Coming up here on the top right, now we have ELT. I notice I like how we have this. New this time, which is a different change from the earlier version of this aircraft. And we have all sorts of stuff with air conditioning. You'll actually notice that we have recirculating fans we can turn on and off here, which make a bunch of racket in the back, but uh, the packs absolutely love those things. We also have our two packs, which are not independent of each other, uh, which again, notice we don't have the fancy lines we have in a 7.3 anymore. All this is basically, do you want it on? Push a button. Do you want it off? Push a button. It's one of those kind of things. And you have your trim air, of course, and pressurization controls, which unfortunately we have no control over. There is, of course, the ability to manually set the landing altitude should we need here. We can actually pull that thing out, crank it, and then push it back in if we want to set it back to automatic. You also notice where this little guy says HUD bright. Uh, we do have a heads-up display. You know, we have taken a look at this heads-up display in previous videos. We'll get into all the minutia of that a little bit later on. But if you want to adjust the brightness, which I recommend you do, you have a little handy-dandy piece right there. Okay, so that's the basic tour of everything. Let's actually talk about getting some electricity. There are two basic philosophies for getting electricity into this airplane. Now, the first thing we can do is we can use the APU or we can use our external power. The first step that we're going to use no matter what is going to be to press the battery switch. Uh, when you hit that, of course, uh, now you're pulling power out of the batteries. The batteries on this aircraft are powerful. Uh, they used to cause some fires. And notice we immediately get one lovely display here that basically provides us with everything we need to know in one spot. You're going to get all sorts of angry warnings and stuff. Uh, notice down here, your CDU is going to come alive. And that's, you know, I mean, you can start programming the CDU off the battery. That's insanity. Uh, don't do that. Just um, go ahead and get everything else running. So when talking to old pilots, of course, our former pilots, uh, one of the things they'll say is uh, they actually sometimes like the APU better because it's cleaner power. Other ones are like, why should I pay for gas when I could just go ahead and press all the exterior power buttons? Uh, one of the things you have to remember, though, is on exterior power, we have no compressed air, which means we can't actually start our engines. So as much fun as it is to and go ahead and uh, press all the ones, at some point, we're still going to have to enable the APU. So you're going to have to decide which one of those makes more sense to you. For us, what we'll do is we'll run off external power, and then we'll switch over to the APU when it comes time to surging. Now, when you first give it electrical power, you're going to notice there's a million angry lights on here. Uh, one thing you'll see is at, you'll see FD. You'll have this little warning about map, and you'll get a big caution warning, and it'll about six pages of cautions here. The reason for that is the fact that this aircraft now, they actually model the IRS. 
Uh, this is not the IRS that everybody hates in the US. This is actually inertial reference system. This is part of your navigational suite. Now, if I turn these two switches on, what it's going to do is it's going to start warming up the laser gyroscopes, which is actually going to enable us to have some backup navigation in the event that our GPS failed. The navigation suite on this thing is very sophisticated. It's not just a GPS. It's a GPS, it's a WAS, it's a VOR, and it's an INS all built into one package. So when I actually click that button up top, you'll see now that we get this little thing that says time to align, and it'll give us a little number that'll start counting down. Now, some of the aircraft that you're familiar with, you'll actually have a little display down here, which you can change the speeds and everything. But you can see as the gyroscopes come up to speed and as it starts to synchronize its position, it'll actually start to, each one of these will start popping on one at a time. You'll see this one starts to pop on. You'll see this one over here will pop on. It'll find all of our locations. You also can see we have attitude now. So we actually know that we're level, which is, I appreciate that greatly. So uh, it's one of those kind of pieces that we can have. Now, as all these things are going, this is an excellent time to start taking a look at the CDU. Uh, there's very, very little stuff that I need to do up here. Of course, me as a real world pilot, the first thing I do is I'd run over to here and I'd start cranking this thing. By the way, did you notice that my map suddenly synchronized and it was Wee! and actually just one of those things very quickly. A uh, real quick tip on the map before we take a look at the CDU is if you actually come up here, which says ND range, you can actually zoom in and out. You can zoom in all the way down so you can actually see the individual details of the runway. It's a fantastic tool. And of course, if I want to be really lazy, you could open up the menu page and you can actually flick on a bunch of extra options here. For now, I'm not going to mess with any of those things because that's just going to make things complicated for us later on. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and zoom this one on. And again, you can see these uh, two pages here. If we wanted to swap them, uh, we could actually pop up here real quickly here. And you'll notice if I press the ECAST button, it shoves that over onto the right, which puts it in the middle. If I push that again, what it's going to do is it's going to just pop it back over here. If I press the engine display, that's the same thing as bringing on the engines down there if I want to see some extra details. And the other thing to notice too is I have these two switcher woos up here. So if I press this one, one, for example, and I press CDU or info. Notice what that's going to be doing is it's going to be changing that one. If I flip this one on, go to checklist, for example, you can see that it's going to be operating the one that's over on this side. So it is going to be up to you to see how you choose to set those up. Like I said, um, sometimes there's a company aspect to it, sometimes there's not. In my opinion, the reason the ND button has got its little box around it is because it's supposed to be for the nav display. For me, I like to do this kind of an arrangement where I have a big, pretty nav display. I like to put all my engine stuff in the middle where it's a very, very accessible and easy to grab. And if I need to grab it back out again, of course, I could just click on it again and snap it back over here. Like I said, it's up to you. This little extra kind of doodad on the side here, it doesn't really do much for me. But again, if I needed to flip individual pieces like my info page, as you can see, is not accessible. We can go ahead and balance those two up. Now, what you're probably saying is, uh, can we come over here and uh, just press the ND again and make it go away? No, we can't actually shut this one off. So like I said, that's one of the upside downsides of kind of arranging it in this sort of a way. So let's float down to the CDU here. What is the CDU? Oh, well, uh, the people who have uh, flown these kind of aircraft for a long times know this is basically our flight management system slash computer. Uh, they, just the CDU is kind of be kind of this aspect of it. Now, in previous versions of Boeing's, of course, uh, what we had here is uh, this would be a big old box with a bunch of keys on it, and you'd mash all the keys to like get it to do all the different stuff that you needed to do. But now it, it's a touch screen. It's actually a combination touch screen and a little keyboard that we have over on the side. Uh, word to the wise, by the way, uh, this button is the same thing as this button. I know that's like, who cares? But it's one of those pieces. And the other thing, I also appreciate the fact they have a little cursor control here, but there's nothing to cursor control, so uh, don't panic on that. One of the things you have to remember is in turbulence, your fingers will never be able to touch these buttons reliably. And uh, having flown in turbulence with touch screens, it, it's hopeless. You just can't do it. Uh, that's why they always have a backup switch, basically, that they can still operate. So the flow for this is going to be identical to the flow that you've probably seen in uh, many other aircraft like this before. We're basically going to establish where we are, what our route is, punch in our performance, and then we're going to kind of go from there. Now, to make this uh, relatively simple for us, which I actually think is kind of nice. So what I'm going to do by starting here is a lot of people, of course, rush over to init ref. Don't do that. Instead, if you look on the bottom here, the next expected page is actually listed on the bottom right corner. So I'm going to come over here and go ahead and press pause init. And what it's going to do is it's going to ask us to tell us where we are. Now, keep in mind, our GPS has already identified us. Too bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and dial in where we are. We're currently at Bradley International Airport. I'm going to go ahead and just like that. You'll notice there's a difference between Bradley and where our current position is. Uh, that's because we're at a gate. We're not just sort of chilling. Now, if you look up in the upper right corner, do you see how it says 1 slash 2? This is notifying us the fact there's a second page here. And if I actually go to the second page, which you'll notice here is all the different flight compute components are all in here together. And they're telling us what their current position is, as well as how accurate they are. You can see my IRU, for example, is a four nautical mile accuracy. Not terribly good. GPS, no problem. Radio, not bad. So our RNP versus accuracy 
actual is fantastic. Our required is two nautical miles. We have 0.02 nautical miles. I'd say that's pretty darn accurate, kind of a thing like that. So I can go back to the previous page. Now notice, after I type that in, the root page is gonna be the next item in the bottom right corner. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. It's gonna bring us here. Notice it's asking for our origin. Oh, if we go ahead and just click it just for fun, you're gonna get a big angry message down here. Don't worry, it'll happen to you a hundred times. Instead, sadly, we're gonna go ahead and have to dial in that airport that we just had a few moments ago. Now you're sitting there going, wait, 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 wait. Can't we just go to position and just click on Bradley? No, unfortunately, they didn't design it that way. So we have to do it the old fashioned way. BDL, Bradley, bam. Now, if we know our takeoff runway, this is a fantastic time to dial that in. Um, I do, uh, we're gonna be taking off runway 24 today, so I can go ahead and dial that in. Notice, of course, if we had like 24 left, we'd have to do 24L, for example. If the runway is not recognized, it'll get very grumpy at you. For example, runway 23, everybody knows runway 23. It's gonna get very angry at you because that simply does not exist. Now, if you run into a situation where you put something in here and you can't get rid of it, you can always come down here and press the clear button. That's not the same thing as delete, so kind of be careful with that. And our destination today, of course, uh, we're going to go over to BWI, which is um, uh, Baltimore, Washington International. I've actually got a flight there coming up pretty soon. A uh, flight number, I uh, can say 100. Keep it nice and simple. The neat thing about this flight number, by the way, is it's now up here, just in case you had any doubt. <laughs> sort of a piece. So now we're ready to go ahead and do our initial activation. That's it. So now we've told the computer that's where we want to go. And uh, one of the cool things here, of course, if we go over to our navigational display, if we were to crank the range, you're going to notice uh, nothing's here. Uh, because we haven't told us how we're getting to our destination. Now, that's an important point there because it's going to affect a lot of other stuff. So let's tell it how we're going to get here. Now, some of you, of course, see the perf init button and go, let's go, let's go, let's go. No, 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 stop, stop. You've got to actually tell it how you're going to get there. You need at least one waypoint between us and them for it to reliably go ahead and get us to that position. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come down here and press the next page button, and it's going to ask us for our route. So now, lucky me, I've gone on to Flight Aware and I've looked this flight up as if I haven't had to do this flight a few times. I'm going to go up to here and just dial in my waypoints. Via simply means I have some kind of jetway or Victor Airway or like one of the T ways or something like that. If you don't have that and you want to proceed direct, you simply type in the name of the waypoint and click two. So we're going to go to Veers and then we're going to go to Pauling. That's not going to be P. W L that's going to get us going again. That's going to be direct. If there's more than one option, obviously we're interested in the one in the Northern hemisphere, not the one in the Southern hemisphere today. So that works pretty well for us. We're going to go to Bizix, B I Z and that's going to be uh, E X. Now fun story about that. I've been told to proceed direct before and had absolutely no clue how, what the name of the thing was. So you're scrambling, trying to find out what they're pronouncing there. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using Quebec. I said, and of course, we're like, you are S Quebec. We're going to take seven, five, and we're going to go ahead and put that over here on this particular side. And then what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, nicely done. Could you at least tell us um, where we're going to get off Quebec? Again, this is one of our airways. So then we just come over here and we dial in where we want to go. So we're going to go to Medana. MXE, it looks, sounds pretty good to me. Uh, this Q75, again, that's just an airway. We're not going to dial in every waypoint. Please don't do that. And then from there, we're going to grab the Victor 378. So I'm going to go Victor 378. We're going to go take that from Moderna. And we're going to proceed from that, and we're going to go down to something called Nuggy. Uh, Nuggy is going to be kind of our drop-off point, which is going to get us very, very close to our destination here. So that's looking like a pretty solid plan there. We're basically going to take off, fly right over there, jump on these airways, use these to get close. Nuggy is going to be our spot that's going to get us ready. Now I'm going to press the Execute button. Now things are going to have changed uh, once we have done that. Uh, the reason being is because uh, now we actually have a way to get where we're trying to go. If you actually take a look at our chart now, you can see our entire journey that gets us almost all the way. Notice there is nothing connecting Nuggy here to BWI. We still haven't actually defined how we're going to get down on the ground here, which I think is kind of cool. You can see how we're going to get out here from runway 24 to Veers, but we have no idea how we're actually going to get here. Another thing to notice, do you see all these little waypoints that appeared along the way? All these waypoints were pre-computed and added when we added in our direct airways here. Now, actually explaining how we were able to get this flight plan, uh, that's a different video, but keep in mind, there's many, many different ways to do it. So that's good. So now, of course, you're saying, let me press next page. Nah, that would just let us into more information here. By the way, we do have a route two option over here on the left, should we require. Uh, we just don't need it, so I'm not going to stress about that at all. And so what I'm going to do is I have my perf in it, and now it's ready to go to the next step. So I'm going to go to perf in it, and it's going to ask for a lot of information here. It's going to ask us for our zero fuel weight, our reserves. It's going to ask for our cruise center of gravity, our cruise altitude, and our cost index. So to get the zero fuel weight, I could go, no, don't do that. Just click on it, <laughs> and then I'll go ahead and put it on the bottom for you. Click like that, it's been calculated. Now we're 373.7 tons, that's enough. 
Our reserves, um, this is just a number you have to know. Again, it does not matter. Again, so a lot of different companies have different reserve amounts. I'm going to go 10.8 because it's easy. Uh, cruise altitude, we're going to be traveling at 310, which is simply the uh, thousands of feet, knock off two zeros, you get your flight level. Lovely. Cost index is uh, the ratio of how much fuel do we want to burn? Um, basically, do we want to get there fast and burn a lot of fuel? Or do we want to get there slow and save fuel kind of a thing? Obviously, the difference here is how much is your maintenance? How much is your fuel? It's a big, scary number. Different companies have different values. I'm just lazy. and put 999 there because why not? Center of gravity, we're not going to stress about that. But I am going to come down here and press the exit button. Next, we're going to click on thrust limits. Now, this is pretty cool. This is going to allow us to define our takeoff thrust. Uh, the takeoff thrust is obviously going to be a function of a lot of different things. But for us, of course, uh, we can just select which one we want. Again, this is usually a company thing. In my opinion, runway behind me is useless. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure we're using takeoff power and we make sure we're using standard climb power. Sometimes there are like noise restrictions or I want to conserve the engine or we want to use a derated takeoff. Those are all possibilities that we can utilize there. So I'm going to go to the takeoff button now. And now this is where things get interesting. This is where we're going to have to pick our flap setting and we're going to have to fix, pick our center of gravity and make sure all these other items are ready to go. So for me, if I float down here, you'll notice we have everything between five, which is kind of the standard. And of course, we have all these little settings in between. Of course, we could take off at flaps one. Uh, we're going to be taking off at flaps five. Uh, we're very light today, so we don't need to get too fancy. That's plenty. And our takeoff thrust, if we wanted to do a derated takeoff, I could define a higher temperature than it actually is. You know, if I take a look right now, um, you know, we're relatively comfortable temperature today. You know, it's like 23. But again, we could put this at 45 and it'll derate our engines. Well, it doesn't actually derate, it just makes them use less thrust. But the important thing here is center of gravity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click here. It's going to grab my center of gravity for me. I'm going to click right there and it's going to tell me what my trim setting is. Uh, today, we're looking at a trim setting of four. Now, if I come over on this side, you have these three reference speeds. I'm just going to click right here to go ahead and save them. And then we have one number that's very important, this 149. Now, if I want to, oh, we can't type in our toga because we actually don't know what it is because we haven't taken off yet. But the reason this number is really, really important to us is we need to come up to our MCP and we need to actually program this in here. That's going to be our V2 speed. That's going to be, you know, after we've already lifted up the nose, that's going to be our speed that we're actually going to be trying to hold initially as we're kind of cleaning up the airplane and everything like that. Now, you'll notice at the bottom here, our FMC pre-flight complete little light pops on and we're ready to go. Now, you're sitting there going, but BWI isn't connected. What are you doing? Well, we can connect it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do that now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to the depth R button. And we have a couple different uh, options we have as far as procedures. Obviously, we're looking at Bradley procedures here. We need one of these. And when we file IFR, we have to uh, file one of these. Uh, the reason being is because if we lose communications, they need to know what we have to do. And we have to know what we have to do. So I'm going to pick the Bradley 6 here. And that's going to go ahead and execute. This is going to cause a new problem. Uh, don't worry about it. We'll deal with that in a minute. And of course, we're also going to be interested in our arrival here. So I'm going to press depth R again. Go to uh, BWI here, and this is when, of course, we can select our different kind of weather and options like this. I happen to know they're landing 28 today, so I'm going to click on 28. And of course, if we need a specific star or anything like that, we can go to different pages. This one's only listing the EMI7. I'm not going to worry about that too much. Instead, I'm just going to execute that. Now, one of the problems we've just created is uh, you'll see here that our route is broken. It goes to Nuggy, nothing happens, and all of a sudden, bam, we're supposed to be approaching here. We've created what they call a discontinuity. Now, if I go back to my route real quick here and I go to my next page, you're going to notice as I shoot through, you have this lovely thing that says discontinuity on here. That's simply telling us that we cannot uh, do this like it is. We've broken our route. So what we're going to do is we're going to delete that discontinuity. Now, if you press clear, nothing happens. Remember when I said delete is a different thing? So now if I press delete and then click on that line, I clear the discontinuity. Now, if you look at my little journey here, you'll notice, ah, look at that. We're going great. But notice, we still have a discontinuity. And this is a, one of the reasons why you have to be so careful when you flight plan. You'll see there's nothing getting us from what we have called vectors to something called veers. That's because this is a vectored specific um, departure procedure. So in this case, what we have to actually do is we can either go direct veers, which is very easy to do, or what we can do is we can delete the vectors if we want to be really, really lazy. So if I go back up to uh, page two here, do you see how it says vectors right here? This is that via piece. Uh, what we can do, of course, is we can click on veers, uh, or we can type in veers if we want to be lazy. Actually, let's go to legs. There we go. That's better. So do you see how I have this thing that says vectors here? If we wanted to, some people are like, why don't we just go in here and hit delete? Well, you could do that, but nothing happens. You can't actually delete a vectors. But what you can do is you can take veers and you can replace vectors with veers. So if you look now, we get to 580 feet and go right turn. And we proceed direct the veers. 
it's just kind of a fun little strategy there that you can utilize in order to basically get yourself there sort of thing. Now, if we were to check this entire flight plan very, very carefully, by the way, all I did is click on plan. You can now step through the whole flight plan and see each individual component to make sure everything looks good. Like I said, what a beautiful approach here. It's a not even a 90 degree turn we have to take. Unfortunately, this is a very short distance and you can see that's, uh, what is that, 12 nautical miles to the end of descent there and there's a little missed approach. Again, fantastic, fantastic aircraft when it comes to avionics. Everything is looking fantastic right now. I'm looking at us right now. I think what we'll do is we'll save the startup and all that kind of fun stuff for the next video, just because we've got a couple more things that we're going to have to do here to make this all work. But you can see that that's our basic setup. Uh, one thing that I like to do too, and I'll, we'll leave us here kind of a thing, is after I've gotten this all programmed and this all ready and this all ready and this all ready and this all ready, is I like to go ahead and dial in a couple quick little things here. Uh, first thing, what I like to do, I like to pop over here and put in our initial altitude, which uh, based on our departure procedure is going to be 4,000 feet. You can go look up the uh, coastal, no, I'm sorry, the Bradley 9 if you want to go look that up for yourself. Our heading, I always like to set this to a runway heading. Uh, this is just really, really handy. And again, uh, this is just kind of, whoops. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the F. Ah, again, they make these things so easy for us. Uh, the runway heading, of course, is going to be 237, which is going to take me a lifetime because I decided to go right instead of left. I'll get that set a little later on. And then, of course, we've already programmed our V2. So next time what we're going to do is we're going to get this thing started, get us over to the runway. Uh, we're going to take off. We're going to start our climb. We'll take a little look at the automatic pilot, kind of play with it a little bit to sort of simulate some of the things that usually come up on a typical kind of a journey. And then, of course, uh, for the final video, uh, we'll do an automatic landing down onto a runway 28 over there in BWI. Enjoy. <laughs>